Welcome to the first Locks and Learning in person of the year. We're so happy to have all of you here. I want to first introduce Reviton Karina Rock. She joined us this year and she is the head of Jewish Life here at TBT, partnered with Rabbi Light. Reviton Rock, will you please come up? Thank you, Reviton. Hi, so I'm Reverend Ross, and, Rock, and um, we're so happy to be hosting this. And I'm pleased that we're still up in the back slide. Thank you. Hi, I'm in the back. Hi. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for everybody as you see for making this happen. And you know that Frank we put so much effort into um, her passion for education and for bringing Jewish life to the community here. And it's a blessing to have um, you and open up doors to the community and so I like to make extra learning and students to honor that um life exactly better. Well, thank you to Rabbi Dreamont and to everyone for being here this morning. We're so looking forward to learning um about your experience. So I'm not so worried you to hear um about your experience and to hear your perspective on um, your care of the fortitude and so so welcome and thank you everybody. I'd like to now introduce Robbie Berg. He is an the Middle East editor of the BBC News website, a journalist for nearly 30 years. He has a particular interest in events in Israel from where he has reported extensively in times of war and peace. He graduated in modern and medieval history from the London School of Economics and was a student of Jewish and Israel studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His book, The Red Sea Spy, was adapted into the Netflix series and he is currently working on a variety of new book projects. From the Holocaust to the modern day, Rocky lives in London where he lives with his family. So good morning, everyone at TBT. Um, thank you for those introductions. My name is Rabbi Ramon Wedmont. Um, can you guys all hear us? Or me at least? Okay, I see a thumbs up there. Just on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank uh, TBT and rabbits and rock um for putting this together it's a wonderful uh, a wonderful opportunity to share not just an amazing story but for you to meet some amazing people some in person like Rafi here and others uh not in person who uh, uh we will meet through their stories um i uh i also think it's important to mention that uh, this week is the is the week of the Yotzat, the the memorial the memorial day of the passing of Eric Sampson of blessed memory, a person of tremendous tremendous courage, a courage which will match some of the people that we will meet uh, in our session today. So thank you for joining us, um, and thanks for the introduction of for, of Rafi. Um, Rafi, let's just ask the the question. Here you are, a nice boy from London. How did you get involved with the thugs and spies and uh, secret agents of the Mossad? I mean, uh, how does that happen? Where did it start? How do you get into that? Uh, that's a hello, everybody. Uh, lovely to be with you all. Um, thanks for having me. And that's a great starting uh, question. How did I find out about this uh, incredible story? And I use the word incredible quite deliberately. You know, I've been, as, as was mentioned in my introduction, a journalist for actually it's more than 30 years now. I've just passed my anniversary. Um, I, in my in my life, I've I've kind of covered a lot of uh, topics, subject matter, all different kinds of descriptions and so on. I've never come across anything quite like this particular story. Uh, just before I explain how I found out about it, uh, just to inform, it uh, looks like, I don't know if the rabbi, if it's my machine or the rabbi's frozen. Can somebody just indicate if you can still 
hear me, see me. Yeah, I'll can... yeah. yeah okay, lovely. Um, how how did I uh, find out? Sorry, I remember I lost my train of thought. How did I find out about this story? Um, a number of years ago, I just stumbled across it. Uh, there was a little snippet uh, on in an entertainment magazine, uh, which was in a social media, which spoke about uh, a top secret Israeli Mossad operation involving a fake diving resort. And there was no more information than that, but it uh, piqued my interest. And then I investigated it. And uh, what I found out was really quite, you know, blew me away. Uh, I haven't something which is not widely known, the, the, these events. And what we're talking about happened in the 1980s. And just to briefly explain this, what, what the story involves is a Mossad operating a fake diving resort to sell Ethiopian Jews out of Sudan and onwards to Israel. There was no information in the public domain about this operation, but I pieced some fragments together and I wrote an article for the BBC News website and I realised that there was more to tell. One thing led to another and I was put in touch with the real life commander of the operation, the guy who instigated it and led it in the field back in the 1980s. And it was explained to me actually by another member of his former team that if I wanted to write a book, I needed to get, his name's Danny, I needed to get his uh, his partnership on this project but it's very difficult you know as a journalist I can't ring the Mossad up and introduce myself as somebody wanting top secret op oper uh, top secret information to write a book so Danny wanted to meet me face to face and he invited me to rendezvous with rendezvous with him Charles de Gaulle airport one Tuesday uh he came in on a night flight. I'd already been there since this morning. I literally didn't move for 10 hours waiting uh, for him to arrive. And uh, we met, we spoke over a cup of coffee. I explained to him my proposition and uh, he said he had recently come back from the film set of the Netflix movie, which was in production. Uh, what One mistake which was made in the introduction in my bio is the Netflix movie, which tells a version of these events. It was not based on my book. They're two parallel independent projects. But the commander, he had been invited to the set of the film which was being made, and he was slightly disillusioned with the way the movie was going to tell uh, the story. It's a piece of Hollywood, but uh, you know, it, it, it served a purpose of bringing these events to the public awareness. But he agreed to work with me on a book. He liked what I had to say and uh, he opened doors. Tremendous, you know, we're talking about somebody who was very, very high ranking in the Mossad. Uh, he gave me access to people. This is, this is a, uh, a slide of Danny during one of the people smuggling operations. He was uh, transporting Jews from refugee camps in Sudan to Khartoum airport in the back of a, of a Land Rover. Uh, this, the, this, when this picture was taken, actually, it was daytime because they never operated in daylight. They parked and they waited until nightfall. But he agreed to partner with me in writing the book. And he gave me access to everybody who, was, who I needed to speak to, right up to the head of the Mossad. So I met his team of agents. I met the Ethiopian Jews, many of them who were smuggled up and out in the most you know, incredible ways. Uh, Israeli Navy divers. Hercules aircraft pilots, so on and so forth. So that's how my odyssey, my journey of discovery began. So that's an amazing, an amazing introduction. Then Charles de Gaulle Airport, making your uh, secret acquaintance with a secret agent. Um, now, I think the just to put it in context for everybody, um, the people that we're talking about in Ethiopia, Ethiopian Jews, um, have been there for all intents and purposes for thousands of years. And just to maybe give a bit of context and background to this, um, how we got involved, how I got involved, so our academy has run various courses already and sessions with TVT. And one of the things that we do throughout the year is we run 
uh, adult education courses around various parts of Jewish life and history. And we, we wanted to do something about Ethiopian Jews. So we ran a course on, on this and stumbled across you know, Jewish geography. I knew someone who knew someone who knew someone who knew Rafi, who knew Danny. And we, we, we put everybody together in the room. And I was in the army in Israel with the Ethiopian Jews. And their story is phenomenal, essentially cut off from every other Jewish community in the world and keeping their Jewish heritage, which is an ancient form, very ancient form of Jewish practice and belief, but keeping it in face of, in the face of terrible persecution. Um, and, and maybe Rafi just share some of those stories that came out, you know, from the Ethiopian community about how they were treated um, as Jews by, uh, interestingly, Ethiopia is, is mostly Christian, it is Christian dominated, but there are also, uh, there's also some Muslims around and, and uh, how were Jews essentially treated in that space? Well, like you said, they go back in, as far back in history as, as we do, as, as descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. There's no doubt about, uh, about that by this day and age, it's been settled, the uh, proper halachic, Jews. Uh, there was actually a period in history where there was a flourishing Ethiopian Jewish kingdom. It lasted for a thousand years, the kingdom of Semien. You can Google it. Think how, think how old the United States of America is, and then you compare that to the thousand year uh, uh, existence of the Jewish kingdom. But then the kingdom fell, and that's how Ethiopian Jews uh, came to be, uh, let's use the expression, downtrodden, uh, subjugated. They, you may be familiar with the term falashes. Falashes, this is a derogatory term. We don't use it these days. Uh, we certainly shouldn't. What it basically means is landless people. Why was it meant by landless people? The Jews were deprived, Ethiopian Jews were deprived of the most important single form of, uh, of, of income, which is agriculture, owning land. They were forbidden to own land. They were discriminated, discriminated against in all manner of ways, uh, socially, economically, politically. They coexisted with their non-Jewish neighbours. Uh, the Jews lived in their own pockets of, uh, of Jewish villages, but they still functioned in society, but they didn't really intermingle. There was no assimilation. The non-Jews, though, they looked upon them with uh, with disdain. Uh, they called them the hyena people because there was a belief that at in the dead of night, Ethiopian Jews would transform into hyenas, attack Christians, Christian Ethiopians, and drink their blood. And very similar to the uh, European blood libel of uh, medieval times. Uh, they were also, by the way, known as uh, as as uh, they were described as smelling of water. They had this 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 odor of water. Well, there's no there's no of course water has no has no smell. But again, the question begs the question: What am I talking about? Why are they why were they known as smelling of water? Because Ethiopian Jews settled by the banks of rivers and running water and stream in order so they could practice ritual immersion, like the the use of a mikvah. And they were they were fanatically uh, clean, and the use of water to wash their utensils and to prepare for Shabbat. For the non-Jews, they were known as smelling of water. So I think that's a fantastic point at which to begin introducing the heroes of the story. And the, I think the first hero and the most important in many ways is an Ethiopian Jew. Um, I hope you guys can see it on your screen, uh, Feride Aklum. And uh, I know that you never got to meet Ferde because he, he passed away, I think, before you he met did. He passed away in, uh, in around about 2010, which sadly was a little bit uh, earlier than my involvement in this story. Ferde, by all accounts, was uh, an exceptional individual. Uh, he was a well-educated man. He was a school teacher and he was also a Zionist. Uh, Zionism was uh, strictly illegal. In Ethiopia in the 1970s, there was a, a there was a change of uh, leadership in Ethiopia. The the uh, sympathetic emperor, who was uh, a friend of uh, Israel, he was overthrown, and a junta, a military junta, took over. They banned uh, Zionism. They uh, 
uh, were hostile. They didn't recognize uh, Israel. And they were pro-Soviet. And, you know, it was a dangerous place to be a Jew in Ethiopia. Faraday uh, was a wanted man. And the reason he, you know, there's a lot of stories in Jewish history where at the end of the story, you can kind of, depending on you, what your beliefs, you can kind of see a, a guiding hand. Things just like the story of Purim, you know, you get to the end, you can see the bigger picture. Faraday was a wanted man. He had to flee for his life. And he made this perilous journey by foot from Ethiopia to Sudan, neighboring countries in Africa. He became the only Jew in Sudan. Sudan in those days was the biggest country in the whole of Africa. Can you imagine being the only Jewish black person in the whole of, the, in the whole of that country? It was also an Islamic country. It was an enemy of Israel. So doubly or triply so, his life was in, was in danger. Uh, to cut a long story short, he got a message which re out which reached the Mossad to say he needed rescuing. Uh, instead of rescuing him, the Mossad actually dispatched Danny to track him down like a needle in a haystack. And uh, they teamed up in Khartoum and between them, they uh, hatched a plan to encourage more Jews from Ethiopia to leave the country on foot to make this perilous journey to Khartoum or rather to, to the refugee camps. And then from there, the Mossad would spirit them out uh, to Israel. It was, uh, it was, you know, to say it was perilous is an understatement. Thousands, maybe ultimately some 16,000 or so Ethiopians made this journey uh, secretly, clandestinely. 10% of the number actually perished. They died. They died en route. The reason they did it was not because they wanted to escape Ethiopia. They'd lived there for centuries, if not millennia. But word reached them that there was a gateway to Israel. That gateway was through Sudan. And every single generation, from the time of the basically the prophets since uh, or just afterwards, the Ethiopians lived in hope that theirs would be the generation to return to the land of their ancestors, which is the land of Israel. That's the reason they uh, they escaped Ethiopia, not because they were avoiding hardships, deprivation, famines, war. It was singularly to get back to what they called the land of Jerusalem. So that, that is Faraday. Uh, and I think one of the important things, I'll just bring up one of the screenshots from uh, the movie. Any of you who've, who've seen it, um, you, can, uh, you can go onto Netflix and see the Red Sea Diving Resort. As Rafi mentioned, it is a particularly, I don't know if you can see that, uh, it's a particularly dramatized, Hollywoodized uh, version of the story. This, I think, is supposed to be that... Uh, in the film, they tried to copy the picture of that uh, vehicle that we saw earlier that Daniel was standing in front of, and here you have Chris Evans. But I think one of the big differences between the film and the original, the book, the story, is that in the film, the Ethiopian Jews are sort of co-stars, if, if, if that. They sort of come along and they're supporting actors. But in truth, they start the story. They're the ones that reach out to the Mossad and say, we want to go you know, we've already, you know, trekked for hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of miles at night through deserts against bandits, scorpions, hunger, thirst, whatever. And, and they, they undertook that journey themselves and they started that process. And I think um, that, that is the first, I suppose, hero of the story. The second, uh, I think, hero of the story is that I, the person who comes up with this mad idea, the idea that the only way that you'll be able to get these Jews out is by making a fake diving resort. And that is, of course, uh, Danny, um, the person uh, who, who you partnered with and the head of the team, the Mossad team. Um, maybe let's, let's talk a little bit about his mad plan uh, for a bit and how unbelievably creative and audacious and mind-blowingly stupid it was, so stupid that no one could ever think of it and therefore was, they were never caught. Yeah, uh, I couldn't have described it uh, better myself. He, Danny, was operating undercover in Sudan, smuggling Jews out. Of course, you have to remember, uh, this is at a time when Sudan was an enemy country of Israel. It had participated in all the wars 
against Israel. It sent contingents. It was the it was the uh, the headquarters of the Arab League. You know, to be a Jew hiding in a refugee camp was one thing. You know, uh, dangerous enough. But to be a Mossad operative operating behind enemy lines in Sudan was, you know, perhaps in many ways even more dangerous. Nevertheless, uh, Danny was operating there undercover. And he was sent up the coast of the Red Sea uh, one time in order to find a beach where it would be suitable for Israeli Navy divers to land in dinghies to smuggle Ethiopian Jews out from the coast to a Navy ship waiting out of sight offshore and then to, then to sail back to Israel. On one of these journeys up the coast, on these reconnaissance trips, he stumbled across the remains of a holiday resort. Now this place, which you can see hopefully on the screen there, this is a genuine contemporary photograph taken by a Mossad agent in a helicopter. Uh, this was a, a complex of chalets which had functioned in the 1970s, but then it had, uh, it had shut down and Danny came across this and it occurred to him there and then that this could be a, a great answer to a problem that Mossad was facing because every time there was an operation to smuggle Ethiopian Jews out of the country, agents had to fly in and out from Israel, super dangerous. It occurred to Danny that if the Mossad could take over this place, turn it round, relaunch it as a fully functioning hotel, albeit a fake one, then the agents could be based there for long periods of time. And by day, the agents could act, could masquerade as hotel staff, cater to the guests, uh, take the guests out on excursions, uh, operators, diving instructors. And by night, they could disappear off into the desert in convoys of trucks, uh, take Ethiopian Jews out of refugee camps, all under the cover of darkness, and then spirit them out to the Navy ship and then return to the hotel. And this is exactly what happened in real life. The Mossad gave this idea the green light. They invested $100,000 into getting this resort ship shape up to kind of, uh, you know, up to quality standard. And that's how the hotel began life. And it's a, it was a phenomenal, it's, you know, it's one of those cases where uh, the truth is strange than fiction. And all manner of people came to stay there. Uh, these are genuine hol holiday makers, diving enthusiasts from all four corners of the world, diplomats, ambassadors. The US ambassador was a visitor there. And none of them knew that it was operated by the Mossad. Uh, one of the, we're talking about characters involved in this story, one of the most important members of the team was a lady, Yola Reitman. She was recruited into what began as an all-male team because, to begin with, the Sudanese intelligence service would send agents to this hotel because they were scratching their heads. Suddenly, out of nowhere, appeared a functioning hotel. And they were suspicious that you know, Ethiopia, Sudan, rather, in those days, was a highly paranoid country. So they'd send agents prowling around to try to uncover what might really be going on in this place. So it was decided by the Mossad to introduce a lady into the team. This is where Yola, you can see her sitting here at the head of the table. This is a breakfast meeting involving members of Danny's team. Danny's on the right hand side, hands clasping the glass of orange juice. Yola was brought in to operate as the manageress, front of house, to lower any suspicion. Of course, having a lady in the team, you know, helps in that respect. Uh, I know her to this very day. In fact, I'm due to stay with her later this year. She is a wonderful, wonderful human being, a pure humanitarian. Uh, without her, this operation was lasted for five years, couldn't have uh, succeeded. And to this day, she's, she's still involved in, she doesn't work for the Mossad, but she's still involved in humanitarian uh, uh, activities. Fantastic. I think the 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 magnitude of this probably is hard for us to understand. It's important to to for people to know we have 140 to 160 thousand Ethiopian Jews now living in the state of Israel. Um, all of that began with the story that uh, that we have over here. 
And as I mentioned, one of the incredible, incredible gifts that, that I have really, and as, as Rafi, as Rafi describes it, a real blessing is to have met Danny. Um, and um, I think perhaps if we can just share some of the incredible stories uh, about him, uh, it will just give you a bit of insight, you, everyone who's participating, into the quality of what this person is about and also really to reflect on what the state of Israel and Zionism is about. Because at the end of the day, um, the, and something I think sometimes we forget, the state of Israel uh, will, it, part of its essential purpose and the purpose of Zionism is to make sure that every Jew, uh, wherever they are in the world, that there will be someone who will ensure that they have a safe place to go, no matter the color of their skin. And um, uh, the late, the, the prime minister of the, of the day who authorized this, uh, the late Menachem Begin of blessed memory, so he, he, he made a very powerful statement, which I think, Rafi, you mentioned. Maybe you could start off with just contextualizing that with, with what Menachem Begin said. Well, you spoke about, uh, you know, discrimination in Israel's, one of the reasons of its existence is to be a safe haven for Jews under threat around the world. For millennia, practically, Ethiopian Jews had longed to return to what I described as the land of, of Jerusalem. And with the advent of the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, and its doors were open to Jews from all four corners of the world, apart from Ethiopian Jews. They were not recognized as proper Jews by the is by the uh, rabbinical establishment, sorry, the political establishment in Israel. They were recognized, they were proper Jews, no doubt about it. Israel itself did not accept them politically. It took until 1977, the advent of Menachem Begin, to turn this situation, this, this historical injustice on its head. In his first meeting with the head of the Mossad, Begin, the incoming prime minister, has a meeting with the head of the Mossad. They talk about planned operations, ongoing operations. Begin says, I want you to put another operation on your list. Bring me the Jews of Ethiopia. He gave a direct command. This was extraordinary. Mossad, of course, you know, can't refuse. Uh, you have to carry out the command from the prime minister. The Mossad is the Mossad. It's not set up as a humanitarian agency. This is what it was being asked to function as. There's nothing political about this story. It's about saving part of the Jewish people. Uh, Rabbi, you mentioned in Israel today, there's perhaps up to 160,000 Jews of Ethiopian origin. Of course, they're largely integrated now. When this operation began in the early 1980s, let's talk about around 79, 80, 81, Ethiopian Jewry stood on the brink of extinction there's, that's not an exaggeration. We now know there were 36,000, that's all, 36,000 Ethiopian Jews left in their entirety. Uh, their numbers were dwindling. Had this operation, this series of operations not happened, we wouldn't be talking about Ethiopian Jews these days. They would have been, they would have vanished into obscurity. But uh, as a result of, you know, let's face it, incredible chutzpah, bravery, fortitude, the triumph of the human spirit in the face of unbelievable adversity, ingenuity on behalf of the Mossad and Danny, and also in equal measure, the bravery, the fortitude and the, 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 you know, the essential longing to survive of the Ethiopian Jews themselves. This, they were equal partners in this, and what was eventually accomplished couldn't have succeeded without the Ethiopian Jews themselves. Uh, the picture you've uh, put on this screen there is, is really quite special because it shows Israeli Navy SEALs in the dead of night. This, these pictures are taken with uh, night vision equipment. They're speeding towards the coast uh, speeding towards the, the shore where the fake hotel stands and on the beaches was the Mossad team ready to meet them with trucks of Ethiopian Jews who they had smuggled out of camps 
a thousand miles away. They journeyed through the deserts of Sudan to get back to the beach and Ethiopian Jews would be carefully handed by the Mossad to the Navy's divers and then transported off to a mothership which was out of sight and then it would sail onwards to Israel. So I think before we move on to the next uh, the next area that we wanted to talk about, I just uh, I'd like to ask: Does anyone have any questions? Who's uh, participating on uh, today, either in live at TVT or online? You can post your question on the chat. Anyone at TVT there? Ribbits and Rock. Anyone got any questions? You can you can put it in the chat or you can unmute. Anyone else? By the way, on, on, the, on the topic of questions, I really in, invite questions. There's no such thing as a, a stupid question, as they say. There may be things which I'm talking about, which I understand, but may be lost on, you know, if you haven't kind of covered, no, if you don't know bits and pieces about this. So you, know, you question me about any terminology or history or anything that you know, leaves you scratching your head. Okay. So I think, oh, I see someone's unmuting. Now right. over here that you have note cards on your tape on your chairs and you can write down your question on the note card and we'll type it into the chat up here for you. Okay. So Thanks so much. Okay, no worries. Thank you so much. Okay, I think what I'd like to end off this section with is just to share some, I think, really startling and inspiring uh and, uh, insights into the characters of the people that gave and who, who were part of this. And I think uh, I'll share one story and then I'll let Rafi share. I know we are running uh, towards the end of the session. Um, when uh, when uh, I got involved with this, uh, as, as people at TVT know, we at the Academy run adult education courses around the world. We decided to run an adult education course on, on this. And we put together a team, as I mentioned, and uh, what was amazing about it is the chance to get to meet not just Danny and not just Rafi, but other Ethiopian members of this team. And one of them was a, a man named Takele, Takele Makonen, and uh, this is he. This is what he looks like. He now not only lives in Israel, he, is, he runs a startup which uh, uh, assists Ethiopian Jews to launch startups. It's a startup for startups. And uh, I hope that they were supposed to have had their first major exit. And when we were talking, um, Tekelis, uh, you know, he, he started chuckling and holding his head when we were talking about this. And eventually I turned to him, I said, Tekelis, why are you behaving that way? Why are you laughing and holding your head? And he said, turned to us all on the chat and uh, on the session. And he said, because you have no idea what it was really like working with this, this, this Danny person, this madman of the Mossad on the ground in, in Sudan. We're in an Arab enemy country where it's illegal to be Jewish, it's illegal to be Zionist, it's illegal, everything is illegal. Um, and uh, he's taking the most outrageous risks. And um, I said, well, you know, what do you mean? So he said, well, uh, you know, Danny, tell them what happened after the, uh, at Pesach time, close to the, the festival of Pesach, of Passover. So Danny tells the story that one time he's working with Tekele and they save a whole bunch of Jews and they put them on the boat. It's the day before Passover. And of course, as you saw, the Jews are being put onto boats in the Red Sea and taken to Israel. And of course, that is what uh, happened in Passover. The Jews escaped Egypt, crossed the Red Sea to freedom. Uh, and many of, Danny's, many of Danny's team were not very Jewishly connected. Danny was very, and still is very Jewishly connected. Um, Rafi mentioned earlier that uh, Danny was the guest of honor at his son's bar mitzvah last year, and uh, Danny read from the Torah. In any event, um, so Danny decides after this operation's finished, the day before Passover, that he's going to make a Passover Seder that, for his team. And many of his team who grew up in, uh, in Kibbutzim in Israel, where they did not get a chance, some of these Kibbutzim did not teach their, their children about Jewish heritage. And so he would run a uh, Passover Seder for them. And this is what he did. And uh, he took them and he organized at the major hotel in Khartoum. And they all sit down. He organized crackers instead of matzah. And they sit there in a country where it's illegal to be Jewish, etc. And he starts reciting the Haggadah from heart 
uh, in Hebrew. And his whole team was shocked. And I said, what are you doing? So he says, no, don't worry. I'll end every Hebrew word with the word Asian. They said, what do you mean? They said, no, well, in English, every good word ends in Asian. Nation, civilization, that's the sound of English. So I'll say the Haggadah in Hebrew, and at the end, I'll just add Asian. So he says, Avadim hayinu lefaru b'mitzrayim Asian. And he conducts the whole Haggadah by heart this way. And at the end, he says, you know, to his team, he says, you know, this... This is what we did today, because we are Moses. Just like Moses took the Jews out of Egypt to freedom across the Red Sea, this is what we did. And I, I, I can't think of a more fitting way to pay tribute to the late Eric Sampson than to, uh, to compare him in any way to, to a person who is so humble as Danny is. Um, and I think Rafi has the most magnificent story to describe how the young Ethiopians at the time um, experienced this. I didn't say this when we were doing, we were doing the session for the kids, Rafi, but uh, the person you talked about, I was in Yeshiva with, Sharon Shalom. Wow. Okay. So I was, uh, now I'm dating myself as well. I was with him. He's a couple of years older than me. He's the first Ethiopian Jew to become uh, an Orthodox rabbi. And uh, he was the first, and there's now thousands um, and he was with me, the most incredible example, as all the, so many Ethiopian Jews are, so rarefied, so special, so gracious, so kind. And maybe uh, I think if you share that story, uh, it really encapsulates everything about the heroes and the, the inspiring part of this tale. I don't know if you can see, hang on, my arm is everything's I happening can see. <laughs> in the mirror. Uh, yeah. That picture there. Yeah, there's three people in this picture. I'm on the at the end with my left. Danny is on the right, and in the middle is Sharon Shalom. Uh, he was visiting. Uh, they were both visiting, and we went for a kosher meal together. Uh, that's a very spe such a special moment. I put it um, in a picture in a frame on, on my office wall. Uh, his story is is really quite um, quite something, and it's in the book. Uh, and he describes how he wasn't always called uh, uh, Sharon Shalom. When Ethiopians arrived in Israel, they were given uh, adopted adoptive names. He was born um, Zudei Mulu. Now, Zudei Mulu was about six years old when he was in a refugee camp. Uh, he had made the trek with his family, hundreds of miles, of perilous journeys he described. They were in a refugee camp waiting uh, for the, to, to be told now is your the night you're going to go to Jerusalem. You're going to be taken out by uh, by white men. Uh, Zude was six years old, and uh, he was told to uh, to evacuate uh, to kind of at a moment's notice. His parents sent him by himself because they couldn't go with. You, know, you imagine this is a mother, father having to let their six year old go off with just a leap of just. Putting their, their, their faith in the hands of people they, they didn't know. So off went Zude Mulu. He was uh, led out of the camp along with around about uh, a couple of hundred other Ethiopian Jewish refugees, all top secret under the cover of darkness. They were crammed into the back of, uh, of trucks uh, hidden under tarpaulin. These trucks were driven by the Mossad agents. Uh, and the journey was to take them from the camps to the uh, off to the Red Sea, off to the coast, as we described. And uh, by all accounts, this was uh, the journey. They were so crammed into these trucks, there wasn't room to basically breathe. It was so like the, the, the expression of sardines. Uh, along the way, uh, they stopped. Uh, Zude was given uh, a juice, a carton of juice to drink. Uh, he'd never tasted juice in his life. This was, he thought it was. It was water. He tasted sweet water, as he described it to me. And he thought, how can water be sweet? And uh, it occurred to him at the age of six, ah, oh, I know what this is. This is water from Jerusalem. It's the sweet Jerusalem water. Eventually, after so many hours, they reached the end of the journey. He described how he heard a noise which he couldn't identify. Never heard anything like it before in his life. As they were, the top of them was lifted. They could see, he could see. He was at the sea. He didn't know what the sea was. He'd never, he'd never seen the sea. 
This was the sound he could hear was of crashing waves. And as he's looking out into the darkness, these were on, these operations happened on moonless nights. Emerging out of the water were two figures, two human-like figures. He described to me how he couldn't believe his eyes that human beings could live underwater, but this was happening in front of him. The only explanation he had for it was that these were two angels sent from heaven to rescue him. Of course, what were they? They were Israeli Navy divers in their frog suits with their flippers and their air cylinders. They embraced him, a child on the beach. They clasped him, put him into a dinghy, set sail with the rest of the Ethiopian refugees and arrived 45 minutes later at this Navy mothership, all in pitch black. The hold of the ship, though, was illuminated because the light was on inside the ship. They entered the bowels of the ship and the refugees alighted from the dinghies, stepped onto the floor of the ship. They knelt down, and they kissed the ground, not because they were out of a sense of relief because they were uh, now safe, not at all. They actually thought that because of the bright light, they were in Jerusalem. They thought they were kissing the ground of Jerusalem. I think that's, you know, that's absolutely beautiful. It's emotional. And, you know, these are very, very spiritual people. They were then and they very much still are now. I think uh, I'm going to ask again, uh, any questions, Rabbits and Rock? Uh, anybody else would like to pose any questions to Rafi? You know, we did a session. We did a session with the high school kids before. They had plenty of questions. <laughs> right now, I think people are just ingesting all the amazing stories that um, we just heard from you, and it's just so inspiring to hear just you know the juxtaposition of our lives here. And we you know we just had Hanukkah, and uh, uh, we you know month a month ago, and um, not even and. You know, we tell the story of how people were playing dreidel to cover up their Torah learning because they weren't allowed to, to uh, learn Torah, right? And we're hearing how, you know, Jews in modern times are experiencing the same things. And we don't always think about that, how our tradition just keeps on repeating itself and, and things that we learn that we remember, we might have to apply. We don't know, right? We don't know what, what the future holds and what, what other people are experiencing. So. It's so meaningful to hear everything that you have to say. And um, does anybody have a question? Yeah. Um, and what was the experience of the Ethiopian Jews once they arrived in Israel? Mm -hmm. oh, uh, that's uh, a very, very good. Oh, sorry, okay. was there a second part to the question? Um, the question was, what was the experience yeah. of the Ethiopian Jews once they arrived in Israel? Well, it was very, very difficult. It was a, before, a, a, before we answer that, I'm going to ask Rafi just to turn around a bit and just, can you uh, just reach behind you and show everybody your book? Oh. There it is. So I'm, I'm going to make a suggestion because I'm sure uh, if, if you've had a just an initial glance into this, um, you uh, and I'm going to plug Rafi's book for him, uh, you should get it and you should read it. Um, if you've watched, and I, I encourage you to watch the, net, the, the Netflix movie, um, it does sort of bring a whole bunch of different stories together, and Hollywood does, is it? But I think you do get a taste. And uh, one of the things that Rafi mentioned is on the set that uh, Chris Evans of, uh, I'm sure you guys know from Captain America and all of that, so he, he did the film at almost no pay. Mm -hmm. he, he, he really didn't uh, get what he normally gets paid because he was so passionate about the story. And the story he was passionate about is less the full, but more the book. So if you want, if you really want the story that that is that true and far more far more powerful than the movie or any fiction, I really encourage you to to have a look at it. Uh, we did a book club on it with Rafi, so it went, and it's maybe something you guys want to think about doing. Everyone can read the book and then you come back together with Rafi and ask questions then once you've gotten the chance. But it, it's really something I would, in, I would really encourage. It's an, a really great opportunity. On to the question, how they were, how they were accepted. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer a bit and then I'll pass on to Rafi. I was in Israel at the time. 
Um, I'm dating myself, as I mentioned. I was in Yeshiva with Sharon and others. Um, and it, it was really interesting because, of course, I'm from South Africa, as other members of your TVT community. And South Africa had apartheid, which was obviously very, very racist. And we, we now, I was in the army with Ethiopian, with Ethiopian boys and in Israeli society with other Ethiopians. And it was really interesting coming from that background, looking at how Israelis and other people reacted to, um, reacted to Ethiopians. And of course, like any society, there is racism. You know, all societies have racism. And uh, I witnessed a couple of examples of that. Not overt, but they definitely, when I was there, I definitely saw. Uh, in the series that we ran, uh, we had on, uh, on our series, we had the first, um, the highest ranking Ethiopian Jew in the IDF, in the Israeli Defense Force, who became the chief medical officer for the Golani Brigade. And I asked him this question, and uh, this was his response. And uh, anyone who wants to, you can actually watch the interview directly. He was an, he's an most amazing, amazingly eloquent man. Um, did two separate medical degrees, um, one in Ethiopia and then redid it in Israel. He said as follows on the session, he said, listen, um, um, the amazing thing about Israelis is that they're always willing to let you make an idiot of yourself. But because they're willing to let you make an idiot of yourself, they're also willing to let you succeed and prove them wrong. And he said, from my experience, even the racists in Israel, um, let me try. That's what he said. And he said there was racism and he experienced it. But um, he said, those were his words. Rafi, your, your take. Well, I won't repeat what you just said, apart from, yes, there was discrimination, because you have to realize Israelis weren't expecting them. The Ethiopian Jews weren't expecting to get to Israel. It happened very quickly. So integration was very difficult. Israeli, you know, Ethiopians, they lived in a kind of a state of antiquity almost. They didn't know what a light bulb was. That's no exaggeration. They didn't know electricity. They didn't know what stairs were. They didn't know what a chest of drawers was. And then a parachute, to, to use an analogy, a metaphor, into the yeah. most, one of the most advanced civilizations in the world integration was very difficult at least for the first generation we're now second or even third generation on and israelis of ethiopian origin have now served in the army they continue to serve they have reached the highest echelons of every walk of life you can think of the sciences academia politics uh, law the military government uh, this, the, the gap is definitely narrowing. In just give me 15 seconds to tell you something which I think is just phenomenal. Uh, in, in the book, I describe the first attempt in modern times, it happened in 1862, when an Ethiopian uh, spiritual leader attempted to take thousands of followers on a on a, uh, a journey to make it back to Israel, to leave Ethiopia on foot and to walk all the way to Israel. Ultimately, it failed, it perished. Uh, the whole description is in the book. It actually happened, it's a true event. Fast forward 100, uh, 150, 170 years or so to present day, the Israeli immigration minister, who I think has just left her post because of the new government that's come in. Uh, she, she served in that capacity for about five, six years. This is the immigration minister, an Ethiopian Jewish woman, the minister of government. The most extraordinary thing, thing is she, her name's Panina Tamano Shatter. She is a direct descendant of this Ethiopian spiritual leader. His name was Abu Mahari who made the first futile attempt to return to the land of Israel. If he knew that sometime in the future, one of his descendants, a female, would become the immigration minister of the state of Israel. You know, wow. <laughs> you know, this is only, really happens only to the Jewish people, perhaps. It's uh, extraordinary. Any further questions? Ribbits and Rock is our time up. I think it is. <laughs>